We've reached the end of 1993 and have passed the halfway point of Nintendo Power's sixth year. This issue, we have a Disney licensed game along with other Super Nintendo titles, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Disney's Aladdin. The art is a mix of various pieces of official promotional art, which is okay, but kind of lazy. In the letters column, the prompt was for people to write in with their favorite Street Fighter characters. The top four are Ryu, Ken, Guile, and Chun-Li, with Dalsim taking up the uh, fifth spot. First up is our cover game. We have maps of the first four stages, which will take the player into the Cave of Wonders and to the Lamp. Aladdin is a well-balanced platform. The movement has a good sense of momentum without giving up any degree of precision. The controls are great, and while you don't have the sword that the Genesis version has, you still have ways to dispatch enemies to clear your path and your animations when making your way through the levels are excellently done. Additionally, the game is not sparing with extra lives, so you don't end up having to start over levels often. Further, the game has unlimited continues, which is one of the other points that can cause problems for an otherwise good game. Where the game falls down is the checkpointing. The game's levels are very large, and there aren't any mid-level checkpoints. If you die, you have to start the level over, with Continue sending you back to the beginning of the act. I understand the reasoning from a balance standpoint, but from a quality of life standpoint, a mid-level checkpoint would still be helpful. As a general rule of thumb, from a game development standpoint, if the Mario games that are contemporary with your game have a particular quality of life improvement, so should other platformers. We next have NHL Stanley Cup. A licensed hockey game developed by Sculptured Software and published by Nintendo. It appears to use the same engine as their basketball games, with the playing field being rendered in Mode 7. Sculptured Software's sports game engine does not work that well for hockey, especially on defense. If you're selecting players off camera, it is really tricky to tell where your character is, as well, your perspective is centered on whichever direction the guy with the puck is facing. Having a mini-map with the rink and the selected player highlighted would have made this so much easier to play. Additionally, while the game has the NHL team license, it doesn't have the license for the Players Association, which makes it hard to tell exactly who you are playing as, leading to a sense of disconnect, particularly when it comes to figuring out, okay, this player I've got is a star player. I want to have this player... Oh, well, I want to take my shot with this guy, as opposed to passing it to someone else. That said, the controls are somewhat simple. Passing and shooting is done with a touch of the button. But it's hard to select an open player, and it's even harder to line up a shot on the net, turning shots on goal into basically a die roll. I would say that still, Konami's Blades of Seal Steel for the NES is a superior hockey game. We have our next fighting game, and our next big fighting franchise to come out of the West, well, for certain values of big, Clay Fighter. We have info on each of the fighters, and notes on how the game's graphics were done. Clay Fighter as a fighting game is visually interesting, but it's also really broken. This is partially due to the fact that this is one of the first fighting games I've covered, that never really had an arcade version. This went straight to the console. Doing an arcade version of a fighting game, even if it's a test machine in an arcade in the town where this developer is located, gives you a degree of understanding of how your characters are balanced, which is a big deal this is your first time making a fighting game. Otherwise, you're just testing it among your players in the audience, or in the office, to find out how the balance works. Even if you're bringing QA people from outside, there's still not isn't that sense that you get when you have an arcade machine set up and just people walking up and playing it and seeing how the game is uh, how the game works or doesn't work based on their reactions further while we've gotten fighting games that were kind of exclusive to consoles before this those were also games that were designed by studios that had worked on fighting games before with that in mind Clay Fighter, while having those issues, has those issues due to lack of experience from the team who designed it. Hopefully, the next title in the series will learn from this game's mistakes and will be a much better game. 
Next is Daffy Duck in The Marvin Missions, an action platformer based on the Duck Dodgers shorts, continuing with the trend by Sunsoft of basing games on a particular series of cartoons or concepts, like with the Roadrunner game. There are maps of each of the levels before the last one. Of all the Looney Tunes games that Sunsoft has published thus far, this is the first one I've felt the need to look up the developer, specifically to pick up, clear up a bit of confusion. I found the platforming quote like a PC platformer, like Commander Keen. So with some checking, I found that this and several of the other Sunsoft Looney Tunes games were developed by ICOM Simulations. You know, the people who did the Mac Venture games, like uh, Shadowgate. This game gets the atmosphere and tone of the Duck Dodger Looney Tunes cartoons really well, but some of the attempts to capture the tone make for bad platforming. For example, firing your gun or blocking a shot knocks you back a bit. That makes sense. One of the jokes in the Duck Dodgers cartoons was the recoil of the gun. However, because the game also has precise platforming, there's the very real possibility that firing your gun to take out an enemy that you need to defeat to in order to jump to the next platform will knock you into a hazard or into the void. Further, as I mentioned above with how the platforming feels, the jumping is very floaty. Duck Dodgers has a double jump through his jet plaque, in fact, but this goes beyond that with an incredibly floaty original jump that makes it very hard to overshoot platforms. The game tries to address this by making hazards like lava pits merely deal you damage instead of killing you outright, but still frustrating and it still means you end up taking cheap hits. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing the Super Nintendo version of Jurassic Park and gets the advice to stay in the trees. That is really bad advice, as in the game, compies and raptors hide there, and they'll can get cheap hits in on you because you're hiding in the trees where they spawn. Next up is Namco's combat racing game Battle Cars, which also appears to use some heavy Mode 7. There are maps for five of the early levels and notes on your opponents for each. This game plays really well, it's basically F-Zero with guns, which I like. The three weapons the game uses, the grenade, which just lobs forward in an arc, the disc, which bounces off the walls until it hits something, and the missile, which homes in on a target, all work really well and all make enemies manageable. And they are each different enough that they fit with different playstyles and different level layouts. There is just one problem I have with the game. Races are too short. You either fare really well off the, out of the gate and hold your position for the home race, or your opponent gets a solid lead, at which point you're screwed because you have no time to recover. Also, the way the game handles upgrades is weird. You can upgrade a variety of stats in your car using two types of currency, cash and credits. Cash upgrades your car's performance, credits upgrade your weapons. You earn cash based on beating enemies in the cross-country segment between races, and you earn credits based on your time bonus and your performance in the races, but you don't get cash by defeating enemies in the races. This limits your opportunities to get currency to upgrade your vehicle. If you earned cash and credits through both races and cross-country trips, this would be less of an issue. But by limiting your opportunities to earn the currency you need to improve your car's performance so you can do better the next race, it makes it too easy to get yourself in a hole you can't get out of, potentially forcing you to have to start the whole game over from the beginning, and you don't necessarily know when you've gotten in that hole. Next is the Super Scope Roundup, with a with info on a variety of Super Scope titles. I haven't had a chance to get hands-on time with the Super Scope recently, so I can't speak for how well it works if you're an adult trying to use it. So I'm going to give the three games covers here a miss. In classified information, we have a trick on how to get the bow for free in Link's Awakening without shoplifting. In the Star Fox comic, Andros and his clone are having something of a disagreement. This leads to Andros flying into the black hole, where Fox's trapped father can take him down. The end. No, really, that's how this whole comic wraps up. Just, just like that. No final true showdown between Star Fox and Andros with them 
finally beating him once and for all. It just ends like that. Moving into Game Boy titles, we have a licensed Tom and Jerry game, which doesn't have a subtitle that appears to be based on the film. The article gives maps of the first six levels. So, to distinguish this from the earlier two Tom and Jerry games I've played, based on my research, this game is officially subtitled Frantic Antics, and it is indeed based on the film. That is, the film that has both Tom and Jerry talking. The game is a mix of levels with decent platforming and crappy enemy placement and crappy levels. The first level of the game is a forced scrolling level with some crappy platform placement that basically relies on road memorization, which is not a great start. The next two levels have interesting platforming with some really good platforming controls, but with also some really crap enemy placement, including wrecking balls that come out of the blue and deal a bunch of damage if you don't evade them just right. Further, the game has no checkpointing. If you die, you start a level over from the beginning, making continues something of a moot point, except this game has a limited number of continues. By which I mean you only get one continue. On the one hand, I understand. This is a short game. On the other hand, as I've said many times before, and will say again, there is no reason to have limited continues on a home release of a game. Still, and I recognize that this is damning with faint praise, this is the best Tom and Jerry platformer on the Game Boy. That's not saying much, but it's the one thing I will say in, in this game's defense. Next is Mega Man 4 for the Game Boy, which appears to adapt elements of 4 and 5 on the NES. There are power-up notes and level maps in a semi-recommended boss order. Mega Man 4 on the Game Boy has its sprites mostly the right size on screen for the field of view. I say mostly because the larger mid-bosses don't quite work right. For these kind of bosses on the NES, you want a larger area to maneuver in to evade their attacks. This is even with guys like the uh, Yellow Devil, where their whole thing is you're evading them as they move across the screen in rapid succession. Here, the screen is a little more confined. A good example of this is the snail mid-boss in Frogman stage. He lobs bombs in an arc, which deals smash splash damage with a gap in between the two platforms. If you jump in between the platforms, you can get hit by the bomb, and there's a degree of random number generation over which platform it shoots at, so you can't spot a platform over which plat over pattern over which platform it will shoot, leading to cheap hits. It's something where enough practice would probably fix the issue, but it's still a royal pain in the butt. Moving into NES games, we have Mega Man 6, and we have a boss order in maps of the Robot Master's lairs, which is extra important, as several levels have false boss fights. We also have some notes in advance of Mega Man X. First off, I find it absolutely hilarious that the opening cutscene for Mega Man 6 doesn't even try to pretend the bad guy is still Dr. Wily. Aside from that, Mega Man 6 plays incredibly well. The platforming is just as good as you expect, the levels are incredibly well designed, and the recommended first stage, Fireman, also serves as really good tutorializing. The game even does a little bit where, if you're knocked into spikes or other similar, op similar obstacles like burning oil during your recovery period, you don't die instantly, so if there's a way for you to get to safe ground during your recovery period, you can do that without dying instantly. Actually, the whole oil pit mechanic in Fireman stage works incredibly well. Oil pits are innocuous or harmless until fire enters the pit, at which point they work like spike pits, which means that if you kill any enemies, they can set them on fire before they have a chance to do that, then they will stay safe. It's a really great example of how they've stepped up their level design for this game. In Counselor's Corner, we have more tips for Dungeon Master. We next have some articles on a couple edutainment games meant to educate kids on health issues. There's Captain Novalin, which educates kids on managing diabetes, and Rex Ronin, experimental surgeon, about the effects of nicotine and tobacco on the body. Both these games did actually come out, and both are very rare. A last game of the issue is Tetris 2, a sequel to Tetris focused on competitive multiplayer. The article has notes on the changes to gameplay, along with some tips on dealing with trash. 
So, calling this game Tetris is kind of bullshit. Because you're not playing with the standard Tetrads. Instead, in addition to your standard pieces, you're getting regular pieces that are not linked and thus will fall in different parts, which you can then control separately after the other halves have made contact with the massive pieces. pieces. This, on its own, could work okay. Except you don't clear the board by clearing lines. Getting a complete lines gets you nothing. Instead, you clear lines by matching items of similar color. So it's sort of like Tetris meets Columns, and it doesn't work. In the top 40 column, Mortal Kombat has taken the top spot on the Super Nintendo, with Street Fighter 2 just behind, setting up a very long rivalry. Link also has the top spot on the NES and the Game Boy. In the now playing column, the also rans include Sunset Riders, Steel Talons, Total Carnage, and Championship Pool. And in the Pack Watch column, Sunsoft has Pirates of Dark Water on the way, Askewear has a Super Nintendo arcade stick, and there's a new Choplifter game coming. I put a lot of thought on this, and my pick of the issue this time is Aladdin. It is a rock solid platformer that plays incredibly well. Yes, it doesn't have a sword like the Genesis version has, but it is still a well-done game. And it is one of the best platformers that the magazine has featured thus far for the Super Nintendo, possibly even in general, that for, for third-party licensed ga third party games, not first-party Mario stuff here. Next time, we enter a new chapter in the history of Mega Man. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.